let's think of things that all together like what are these big things we all want to attack and like instead of building like different companies let's build one that will just stick and make sure it is done welcome to hustle share the podcast that features the daily grinds of unique hustlers around the world to show not our differences but that our hustles are very much alike. Now here's your host, Ronster Bae Pyong. Welcome to another episode of the Hustle Share Podcast. My name is Ronster and I'm your host. If you're new to this podcast, um, welcome to the show, first of all. And uh, this podcast is about hustlers sharing their hustles to other people and the objective of the show is not to one up each other the objective of the show is to learn from each other and to show that hey all our hustles are pretty similar to each other and we should not be one upping each other rather you know we should come clean and remove all the bullshit from all our stuff and help each other out in this episode we're very very fortunate to have been joined by one of those people that I have high up in my list. Um, I, I, when I thought of this podcast, I, I, I thought I've always thought of having this guy on the show, but I didn't realize that I can have them this early. So we're very, very lucky to have him share his his knowledge and experiences to us because his journey and his hustle is very, very unique in its own way. So wh- who I'm t- am I talking about? I'm talking about. Mr. Earl Valencia. Currently, Earl is a venture advisor for startups and corporate innovation teams, where he focuses on growing companies for emerging business units from seed to scale. He's currently based in San Francisco. He's currently the managing director at the Charles Schwab Company. He was part of the advanced engineering team for the Dell EMC and previously was the program manager for corporate data at Bridgewater Associates, the world's largest hedge fund. Most people know him though as the co-founder of the Idea Space Foundation where they help fund startups or they grant startups with, with this the competition that they run every year to, to help the most uh, innovative startups or ideas here in the Philippines. During that tenure, he was also the VP for Corporate Development and Innovation at SMART. What's interesting about this episode is that he's going to be discussing why he left and what he did after that and what he's currently doing to help the Philippines to prepare for that next leap in terms of startup innovation. What's very interesting about this episode too is that Earl came clean of how he actually started his journey as a tech geek or as a, as a, as a student from UP all the way to how he hustled to be an electrical engineering uh, student and got a summa cum laude in the Boston University. So this episode is going to be very interesting. Please stick around and enjoy the show, which is going to begin now. Welcome to the Hustle Share podcast. We're now in episode four. Uh, I think it's four. Uh, and we have a... Wow, episode four. Great. Yeah. Uh, the first couple of episodes uh, was all startup people. And then the last one, I uh, interviewed a lawyer who also is into startups but today we have a super, super special guest. This is, I, I can't believe he said yes this easily. <laughs> and we're, we're on a phone patch, we're on a Skype call with Mr. Earl Valencia, the founder of Idea Space Philippines. Earl, welcome to the show. I'm uh, glad to be here, Ron. Ronster. Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh my God. Uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm definitely glad that you invited me here and so happy that we reconnected all these years, my yeah, friend. It's been a long time. Uh, I can't. I don't remember actually when the last saw you, but you've been instrumental in my journey, and I, I'm very grateful that you found time. Even if, how, how, what's the time right now in in your side of the world? Uh, shoot, I don't know. I think it's like 10:30 at night oh, no. here in San Francisco. But oh, God. you know, it's Friday, and uh, you know, talking about hustle, I, I just love having meetings, discussion, or podcast mm-hmm. interviews later at night, right? Awesome. Thank you. So, so Earl, let's get, get straight to the jugular because I know it's late and I want to make sure that you're in your tip-top form when we do this. Um, what's your hustle now? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm actually doing a couple of things and it's a bit complicated, right? Okay. But then I bucket kind of my 
my, my, my things right now to three major things, right? So one of them is that I, you know, I, I'm basically managing director of this new buzzword called digital transformation wow. for one of the largest uh, financial institutions here in the U.S. So think about it where, you know, a lot of these companies are trying to, you know, automate themselves, make themselves more efficient, but instead of just manually changing their processes, a lot of it will be doing with regards to digital um, processes. Most of it is probably related to algorithms or artificial intelligence, right? So it's still, you know, applying technology towards you know, making sure operations is more efficient. Uh, and then the other large bucket um, is is still I, I you know I love startup. I, I love yep, venture. Yep. So I, I still advise a lot of startups. I'm in a number of board of advisors. Wow. Um, from fintech companies um, to advising a bunch of maybe new venture funds to, you know, the one that's uh, kind of most interesting. Actually, two of them. One is a like a defense uh, contractor started out by a veteran. So we're trying to wow. like bid out with contracts with like Air Force and and like you know Department of Transportation here in the U.S. And another one actually is a pretty wild one, which is um, trying to make Expedia for space travel, right? Oh, yeah. so as long as it's not Theranos, we're in the clear. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, and uh, you know, I think I, I just love uh, being, you know, being there and seeing yeah. and, and helping guide um, kind of entrepreneurs, especially yeah. from the zero to one stage. That's really my passion. Yep. And then the last bucket, obviously, is just my love. My love for the Philippines is still strong. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still active in a number of kind of boards, nonprofits um, that relate to the Philippines. So here, for example, in in San Francisco, I, I still um, is am part of the Science and Technology Advisory Council to the yep. Philippines. So I'm working Stack. together with the consulate. Yep, in Stack, mm -hmm. working with the consulate in many different programs. I've hosted uh, at least, I think, once a month a entrepreneur slash innovation event here in San Francisco and just collect the Filipino and Filipino American community, especially in technology together. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also, I mean, obviously I, I still advise a lot of things in the Philippines. Um, you know, idea space is still close to my heart. Yep. And then Q that's your baby. Yeah, and then QBO, who um, yeah. is kind of the you know son slash daughter of Idea Space, yep. um, in conjunction with the government, you know, took on its own life. And kudos to the team there, led by Cat, yep. who made it something out of nothing. I left there with you know support, um, you know, some funding. Um, and you're coming back, right? You're yeah, coming back. You're gonna back be here next week. Yep. Yeah, I'm coming back next week to literally see QBO for the first time in the flesh. Oh, dude. And I'm super excited, right? I mean, obviously, I'm excited to also see my idea space uh, kind of peers and even the people from Startup PH. But, yeah. you know, so it's really, really three major buckets, right? Like, you know, one is basically like, you know, my kind of corporate hustle, if you want to call that. The other right. one is my venture hustle. And the last one really is like my, passion. you know, passion, love for the Philippines hustle, right? Dude, you're, you're wearing a lot of hats. And obviously, this is, this is not... Um, it's not common that, that people have to wear these hats and the type of hats that you wear is crazy because a lot of Filipino startups look up to you as one of the four founders of, of what it is, right? Then back in 2011, 2012, that's where the real startup movement, other, prior to that, there were a lot of, you know, here and there, there's companies, we call it internet companies, but it really solidified when Ideaspace were, was born, Kickstart was born, it had just steamrolled from there. And let's just track back a little bit. So right now you're wearing three three main buckets. Let's I mean three main hats. Let's talk about that. Uh, but, but later on. But let's start to how did you start this hustle? Where did this love for startups and technology stem from? Ah, uh, yeah. So I mean, it, it really depends on how far do you want to go, right? Like you know, you can go far as since you know, I was a kid or as far as even in high school, but yeah. maybe let's start from there just to be like totally transparent and okay. kind of a fun conversation, right? Sure. And, you know, maybe not a lot of people even know some of the story. So, um, you know, it's 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 really fun. I can remember the exact feeling slash time. I don't even know the exact date when, um, you know, my, my, you know, I when I was a kid, like I love random things, dinosaur, space, yeah. And I wanted to be like, you know, an astronaut, paleontologist or whoever. I'd like geeky stuff. Maybe that's a common thing. I like I just love science and technology even yeah, as yeah. young. And you and studied where I, in high school? Um so I went to La Salzabel. Um, DLSZ, in, yep. Yeah, yeah, DLSZ. 
And, you know, I remember for sure, maybe I was like 10 or 11 and my, you know, my, my parents, my, you know, my, my, my auntie, my tita was in Houston, Texas. Okay. And one of the requests I did was to kind of go visit NASA. Right. And wow. I asked, you know, I, I, I saw the Saturn V rocket, which is like the, the, the rocket that made um, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin go to the moon. And I oh, asked a tour guide. Wow. I asked a tour guide, like, you know, how do I become an astronaut? This is like the best thing ever. And yeah. guess what? Because, I mean, it's funny. Maybe for that person, he didn't really care. But he just told me, like, you know, you got to be an engineer. Almost everybody here is an engineer in NASA. Oh, and I wow. was like, oh, shit. And that that small conversation when I was 10 or 11, like, just got imprinted in my mind. Got stuck. I remember you talking yeah. about this when you were doing your talks. That when you, did, yeah. you, you wanted to be an astronaut. Yeah, I totally want to be an astronaut, right? And, and 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 you know, I'll tell you, maybe this is like, maybe talk about us and all these things. Like, right. that, it gave meaning to almost everything I did from that point on, right? So, like, when I studied physics, when I studied chemistry in high school, when I, like, you know, th th think about science or even thought about my grades, right? I always right, right. think, like, how can I get closer to becoming, like, you know, an astronaut, right? Which is yeah. totally, like, bizarre, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, at the yeah, time, totally but fair. it was it was really you know, it really was a pivotal point kind of in my life doing that. So after that, you know, I went to um, engineering school. I went to UP first, yep. um, but then I decided to transfer out uh, into the U.S. And it's not because wow. UP is not an amazing like, institution. Actually, it's, UP it's another is institution UP. that yeah UP changed my life oh. uh, for many different other things right I think that's where my love for the Philippines got like totally solidified yeah. and, and, and and thing but then I realized that my goal at the time was to you know um, go to like a top uh, graduate school in engineering and uh, you know I just knew at the time from UP like I looked at the odds it's going to be difficult I mean obviously it's not impossible but difficult because mm -hmm. I was you know, I wasn't like the number one in my class. I knew that like I was I was okay, but I wasn't like really good. So I'm like my chances would be very small. Yeah. So um, you know, I got you know a scholarship to go out uh, to go to school in Boston. Which and are that, you? Can you divulge with school? No, yes, yeah. so I went to Boston University, nice. um, and then for about two years or so, and I graduated there with electrical engineering. Nice. Um, and then I was debating after basically BU if I was gonna go to. I got an admission to MIT, which is across the river for my PhD yep. in nuclear engineering, or um, masters for free in University of Illinois, or um, or basically like you know it's funny when when. When it when a companies got wind that I got admitted into MIT, like I I interviewed for a job in Raytheon, which is an aerospace company, on a mm -hmm. Monday, um, and then they made me on-site interview on a Saturday, and they gave me an offer on a Sunday. Wow! So literally in a span of six days, um, you know, I, I I I my career path changed from being a PhD student into becoming um, an aerospace engineer. Quick right? question, and, Earl. From that point, because this is not common again, like what I said, not a lot of people know how to hustle, at least from a college point of view, where you're from, you're studying here and you said you, you wanted to increase your chances of being an astronaut, right? How did you open up the opportunities to be uh, transferred to a Boston uni University or get a scholarship there? You know what, talk about hustle, that's exactly what I did, man. It's yeah. funny. So, I mean, obviously the good thing is that I had some guidance. My brother was um, in the U.S. and oh. I called him and I remember this. I was like, I think maybe 17 at the time. And I told him like, you know, uh, bro, and he's much older than me and he's even more successful than me, than me at, by leaps and bounds right now. He's the, um, you know, head of rehab for the New York Knicks. Now, New right? York but, Knicks! Yeah. yeah. Oh, and, yeah. Um, you know, I remember during that time, I was like, you know, bro, like, what, what do you think? Like, how, how is it in the U.S.? And the first thing he told me, like, you know, if you can get your chance to transfer here because... 
um, that would be better because you know as much as we think that for example UP is a is a school that people really care about here mm-hmm. um, you have to hustle like everyone else versus if you do it in the middle and get like a degree that's US recognized yeah. you just have to skip more steps Got and that kind of pivot to that and yeah get a head start compared to everywhere else because your mm-hmm. diploma would be the same as everyone even if you didn't start there and I after that like I I went to the internet at the time which just you know dial up speed and i <laughs> i literally researched all the different schools and i applied to at least at least 10 if not even more schools wow. right and i was like obviously from the idealistic all the way up to not idealistic right i i yeah. you know i i applied to like mit stanford princeton berkeley right, right. The, name it all ivy league yeah. and they all rejected me they oh, all wow. rejected me Right, there's only two schools that actually three schools that mm. accepted me. One is University of New Hampshire, which is like, yep. you know, a, a good school, a state school, but not as known. Mm-hmm. Um, and then one was the University of Michigan, which is actually a top five engineering school. Mm-hmm. Um, and then BU didn't come in until literally one month before the start of school. So why did you choose BU school. out of the three? So, it, 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 to be honest, I didn't have any choice, right? So Michigan, um, what happened was and. I mean, obviously now it's, you know, it's years later, like yeah. when I thought that I was going to transfer ready and Michigan gave me the admission email, mm-hmm. um, I, I just didn't take my academics that seriously. I took the subjects just to learn and then mm-hmm. try to take the exams. And lo and behold, I failed one subject mm-hmm. and they came back to me and asked me for my final transcript. And, you know, in the end of the day, like I think my final GPA in UP at the time was like 2.1. And they wow. said that you got to be at least at you know, a 2.0, which is equivalent to like a 3.4, 3.5. So oh. they, they upsected me, then they rejected me, oh. right? So I thought my life would end already at the time because mm. I was like, oh, shoot, like I literally failed already. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my classes, I thought I had an out. And then, um, you know, so that I, it was like a kind of a, a, a low point in my life. Mm. Um, but I was lucky that, you know, literally... Uh, another door you know, opened. Another door opened. You know, I was already in my third year taking normal th- third year classes kind right. of in UP and this, lo and behold, this admission letter came in and I, I called them up. It's like, hey, I know it's going to start in four weeks. Can you still show up? And they said, uh, yeah, sure. Come, come on over. Wow. And that that changed kind of my trajectory as well. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what happened to me. And, you know, it's funny because I now I don't even remember that I, I literally applied to like, yeah. Whoever and I, I, I remember like I just I, I was always like applying, applying. I got like all these requirements done, like right. you know, um, even when I was in school. And I just you know, and all the rejection letters came out, and yeah. I was like, holy shit! Like maybe it's not meant for me, right? Yeah. And um, it just kind of happened, you know. Yeah, and then you know, just through grinding and doing your 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 dirty work, um, eventually you you got in, and that yeah, opened up got- a lot of doors. Yeah, exactly, right? And then obviously when you're there too, um, the one thing that shocked me when I went to BU is that, you know, in UP, obviously I was, you know, my classmates were probably some of the most brilliant people in the yeah. world. Uh, but then here, like, you know, you're now competing with people from many different backgrounds, like right. people from China, from India, people from the US, right? Like, and they are very different from you, right? So yeah. the hustle part there really is, you know, and, and the U.S. how they gra- they do their grading is based on what they call as a curve, right? So it's right. literally the percentile. So top five yeah. percent get the A, the next top five percent get an A plus, blah blah, blah right? right? So right, right. that's the time because in 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 the Philippines we're trained to be like absolute, right? Like if you get ninety and above, you get like you know an A or something, right? Yeah. And the rest you get B. But there's like percentage. So you got to be better than your peer. Right. And I was like, man, these are like the people from like China or India that like crazy study hours and like do not sleep and all yeah, these crazy yeah. things that I just did not anticipate and I just had to compete with that and I was lucky that uh, I came out you know uh, pretty good in the end and got nice. these other opportunities right and um, you know just maximized it by literally focusing and making sure that like I just studied the hell out of like my time there right it's totally crazy that is awesome um, yeah and and maybe that that part of like this discomfort Uh, that led to work ethic just kind of helped me in the end I think even in life now Earl uh, I'm curious so you went from you know Boston to having this offer now just fast forward it a little bit to how did you go back or what was your first job after that and how did you go back to the Philippines 
Yeah, so uh, that's a good point, right? So um, I I went um, after that to to Raytheon. So I accepted the offer of Raytheon yeah. that you know they were kind of converting a bit. So I was an aerospace engineer for about four years or so. Aerospace In between, I did my engineer. Yeah, how cool I did is my that? Math. <laughs> I've never met anyone like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's pseudo common, but actually not very common, right? Because this industry is very niche, um, you know. But it was really like cool. Like every day, it's like you know, you're you're just thinking about like things that probably will only happen in the world like ten years from now. What, right? what so do you guys do there? Just out of curiosity, like in yeah, general so, terms, non jargon. Um, yeah, I mean, it's basically like think about it where um, you know anything to do with defense, right? So think about like it could be uh, radar systems or mm. drones or you know missile defense systems or you know um, anti-terrorism wow. algorithms, right? Like all these things are all kind of fair game or satellite systems, right? I was simulating like satellite constellations. Sure. Um, that's one of my jobs, right? So these are the things that was kind of there and, you know, it really kind of solidified my love for engineering. And I mean, I, I maybe didn't become an astronaut, but I was at least pretty close, pretty, pretty close pretty. about that. And then um, I, I ended up uh, applying to one business school, which is Stanford, and um, I got in. I was the, one of the first admits that didn't take the standardized test called the GMAT, which is the big kind of MBA uh, standardized Whoa. test. Um, they made exceptions during that specific year that I applied um, to attract kind of people who might not have a business background that is totally like hardcore. and. Uh, I was the guinea pig, and you know, after Stanford, that again changed again my trajectory, and I ended up in the incubator of Cisco. And when I was presenting, um, you know, I was in Manila for like my wedding, and I, you know, the country manager of Cisco at the time said, "Earl, can you talk to one of our large customers, PLDT Smart?" Mm -hmm. And you know, me being a you know an obedient corporate guy, I was like, "Yeah, why not?" And okay. lo and behold, like. They invited me to meet with um, with them and ended up meeting with um, MVP. with you know MVP Manny wow. and and um, you know MVP and I I think just hit it off. We spoke for like two three hours just talking about like Silicon Valley, how we can change the Philippines to become a more technology oriented um, you know country. And yeah. he was just telling me like you know that was one of his frustrations and. Mm -hmm. He hasn't found anybody um, for the longest time yeah. to take on this mission, and he said that why don't I come back to the Philippines? And I didn't really want to come back, but um, you know, just you know, he basically asked me the question, like, what, you know, what, what do you want to do? And I said I wanted to become exactly the DOSC secretary when I'm 60 years old, and he's like, oh. why can't you do what you want to do when you're now when you're 28? Wow, that is amazing. Now, yeah, and so, that story. So, right. Earl, let's just take a quick break. But after the break, we're going to be talking about your journey and how you started Idea Space, all the way to how you went back to the States and did your continuous hustle. More of that after the break. Hey, do you guys like what you're hearing so far? If you do, please don't forget to show us some love and subscribe to Hustle Share on your favorite podcast app. You can listen to us on Spotify iTunes, Google Podcasts, and all the other major podcast apps. Also, if you want to get in touch with us and suggest the next hustlers you want to hear in the show, please do messages on our chatbot on Messenger. Just search Hustle Share or go to m.me slash hustle share powered by chatbot ph. And lastly, if you want to know more about the details and resources we discussed during each episode, please go to our show notes at hustleshare.com. Cool? All right, back to the show. And we're back after the break. Uh, Earl, you still there? I'm I'm here, locked and loaded, my friend. Locked right. and loaded. I know it's late. Now let's 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 continue to the grind. Okay, Earl. Totally cool. So when you came back, and MVP said, "All right, why don't you do what you're you want to do when you get to 60? I'm pretty sure that was tough because you you recently said you just got married and whatnot. What was the hustle like putting up idea space from the ground up? 
Uh, wow. I mean, that's uh, that's such a great kind of time in my life, right? Because it, in funny, actually, Idea Space was supposed to be like my side project, right? Like that's why even now uh, it's incorporated as a nonprofit, uh, just because we thought that this would be like kind of the CSR version of even my own kind of main thing, right? And you know, for the first six months, like we launched it, you know, MVP kind of launched it, I launched it, we did a bunch of road shows, um, and you know and and you know me being at the time like you know head of innovation or smart i said oh you know what that's a cool kind of side thing mm-hmm. um and and one thing that I, I just totally remember this like i was i was like in 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 ateneo which is one of our first boot camps right and when we did this like literally like i had to pinch myself because i think like I don't know, a couple hundred people showed up and oh. about, you know, and like this first boot camp that we did. And I was like, I was telling my co founder, Martin, like, wow, this is real. Yeah. This is real. It's like, holy shit, like, this is, this is real, right? And at um, that time, it, there was the startup ecosystem, even the term startup was very jargon. People, there was no yeah. industry yet, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? And, you know, and 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 at the time, you know, and I before that I ran Tisco's Global Idea Prize, so I was kind of used to like kind of this whole national competition. Right. All these, things. I was like, I I did a global competition. That should right. be easy. So put it up on the web, give some marketing, and things will happen. And you know, even even if you know, I was like, let's do that. We even had like an advertising agency like help us with like collateral. We put it right. in Acquire and all these other news prints. And you know, when we put it out. Um, Literally, we only, I think, on our first week, we only got, I think, 30 submissions. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I remember I was and, one of, in one of the boot camps yeah, in US too. I think so. Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, and yeah. I was like, oh, man, like, this is really bad because we did this big, like, normal marketing campaign. We spent, I don't know how much, hundreds of thousands, not even millions of pesos yeah. to, like, tell people we're now open for submissions and that I didn't get the, typically when you open, you get this huge spike Boom. of, like, 100 plus entries and right. no. So I was very kind of deflated for a bit, even if I, you know, kind of pinched myself like a couple of weeks before. Right. Um, and I was like, you know, maybe this is just like really totally like a side project. And then um, my board, um, I remember this, MVP just told me, Earl, like, you know, you got to do a road show. People have to trust you, okay. right, with their idea. And I was like, mm, road show, that's totally like 1970s, my friend. But uh, <laughs> You said that and, to MVP. <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, I, I was just saying like road show, wow. like, Okay, interesting, right? Um, but you know what? That was the origin of like why Idea Space for the longest time um, did what we call this this boot camps, right? Like going to universities, mm. going to different parts. Like one of our first like boot camps out of, outside of Manila was in the University of Southeastern Philippines in Davao, right? And then um, you know like. It's only that time, so I'll tell you a funny story. So I was there doing a boot camp, like when you you were in USD and we didn't want the name. And you know, I was telling people about like our vision, and yeah. I said like, you know what, whoever will win the top ten of this competition will give them, you know, half a million pesos, which doesn't sound a lot of money yeah. even today standards, even that time standards. Mm-hmm. Um, and like someone asked me like, what you know, sir, um, what you know what if our family doesn't have that much money and we can't repay you like how i don't want to ah. join this competition. and and i told her like no this is you know like you, you and i know i mean you you you, yeah. you know so selling company like, like it's equity right like right. i give you some money i get a percentage of your company and i said if you do very well both of us make money if you don't do well then i lose my money and that's the right. risk i'm taking on you yeah they're, they're and, you're betting on them yeah, and, and it is so bizarre. Like they then then she just started to cry. Wow, she just got shot. <laughs> She's like that you're telling me that like you know, like it it's possible to get money and investment without necessarily paying it back. Yeah. Because that was yeah. alien at that time. Again and at that time, right? Yeah. Like yeah, I mean it's this early days, this notion of like startup, equity, venture capital, all mm-hmm. these things are just like super like non existent. And mm-hmm. that's when I realized that, you know, number one, like I think my board was correct in telling that, you know, they have to know the people. Yeah. And then it's actually not just that, but then you have to then tell the message, right? And evangelize. 
literally like them. your Jesus going through all these sounds talking about yeah, and telling yeah. people about like yeah this is the good news right like yeah. this is like what we what we did and I, you know I want to quote like you know Paul Pajo who was like one of my partners in crime yeah. and he was like called it the, you know the, the the evangelist right like he yeah. had the developer evangelist thing but then I also told him he's the startup evangelist at the same yeah, time yeah. because we have to spread the good news and it's true actually right like we went to like all parts of the Philippines I was in a plane or one of the people on my team was in a plane like every other weekend every weekend maybe even and mm-hmm. you know with a big mission right the mission is like how do we get more people aware that this opportunity exists that maybe didn't exist ever in their life and you know and that's why in our first year we got close to 700 entries and wow. that just everyone out of the park like it was totally like so inspiring because the demand was there yeah. Right. And then in our second year, we got I don't know how many entries. And then the third year, we got like thousand plus entries from like even multiple countries. Right. Actually, every continent minus yeah, yeah. Antarctica. Right. So, <laughs> you know, like it's pretty crazy. But I remember that like at least for the first three, four years of Idea Space, and this is something also from a hustle perspective, right? Like we yeah. probably either attended, supported, or funded more than half of the innovation or startup event in the entire country of the true, Philippines. True. We're now, just a, yeah, we're just an organization of 10 people, right? Even less. Correct. Now, Earl, here's one, here's one thing I wanted to understand. And this is something that I'm pretty sure a lot of people would want to understand because it's easy to understand the hustle of a startup founder because that's common. We can always congregate over beer and whatnot and talk about, you know what, this is such uh-huh. a hassle. But what is that hustle? What is the daily grind of a VC, or from in your perspective, or you said you already said you gotta do a roadshow. But how do you judge us? How do you know that this is a fundable idea? What are the things that you prepare with on, on a daily basis just to say, all right, I'm betting on this. This is hard earned money by our local, uh, by our limited partners, whoever money it is. How do you qualify one? Yeah, I mean, obviously, like, you know, there's there's always the science part and there's the art part, right? Okay. And the science part is, like, what is your basically repeatable process to screen people, right? Like, you have the normal criteria, right? Like, the, the you know, the people, the technology, the need, the market, right? Um, the differentiation, right? All these things are, like, what every single venture investor will say over and over again, mm-hmm. Right. And then there's the art piece, which is this kind of belief on the future that someone's trying to build, Mm -hmm. right? And why is it good for either the world or good for the country or good for more and more people, right? Because number one, you want to make sure it's, you know, affecting lots of people because then potentially that could be a big business, right? So that like weird kind of belief that like you know this particular like idea or this particular team like will do wonders sometime in the world right and that's that that's something that like i you know as much as i think i can quantify like it it is very difficult to quantify yeah Yeah, it's totally an art right and then um from a hustle of a venture capitalist in general like there's two things that you will, will always differentiate you right like one is about deal flow okay right and the other one is about making sure that your fund sustains, right? So okay. deal flow is just like, that's why you're always out there. You're always trying to talk to people, trying to make sure you get the deals, you're invited to the deals, mm-hmm. um, you know, and people want to like talk to you, right? So I think that's really the big thing and making sure that you're you're there and, and being genuine by doing that, right? And then um, the other part really is, you know, making sure that, you know, you're sustainable and making sure that you invest in the right ones, making sure that the companies that you bet in do very well. And, uh, you know, and, and like any founder, especially if you're like the partner or someone who runs it, like you're always in constant potential fundraising, if not business development with your limited partners, right? Okay. So now, Earl, always in question. Board. Yep. Um, on the, on the, on the said you want it to be in the, you, in the know of all the right founders or the right deals, right? It's, it's always a, I, rem- I forgot the number, but, you know, um, we all know that 90% of startups fail. Do you guys know that, that, you know, at the end of the day, the metric is there, out, of the nine, uh, out of the 10 startups that we invest in, nine will fail, or probably one will succeed, 
10, 2 will be okay, the 7 will be dead in the water, right? Yeah. Was that, is that a fair metric or whatnot? Yeah, but you don't go into the, each deal knowing that that's going to be the metric. Like you, you are so optimistic for each deal when you invest mm-hmm. in it, right? And you're talking about deals, right? And you've done an earlier deal, well, before you left, that now turned out into a win. And we all know what that is with coins.ph, right? Uh, this is um, this is an amazing deal. They just recently got acquired by Gojek. Yeah, <laughs> and um, it's, it's it's totally amazing, right? And um, you know, even with that, actually, I um, you know I fought for that deal, right? Like you know, I fought for that deal, making sure that 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 kind of went through. And it's because you know, number one, like you know, this again talking about like people relationships as founders and stuff, right? Like you always have to be open to like serendipity and possibility. And like, I was the first um, person that Ron met in the Philippines. Oh, really? I don't right? Know. Yeah. Go um, way was the one, the reason why he got here, right? Well, that was, that was yeah. his friend, right? But then he had to w- go through Manila and um, mm. one of my buddies, so Ron used to work in a venture fund and one of my classmates from school runs that venture fund, the ah. Eric Schmitz fund. And, um, He's like, yeah, you gotta meet my classmate Earl, my buddy, who's in Manila doing some startup stuff. And like Ron and I met, I remember in our office in, you know, in, in Metro Pacific and BLDT. Yeah. And you know, we just talked about stuff like, what are you doing here and all that stuff. And then I remember also the day that like he emailed me and said, hey, by the way, like I went all around like the world, all around Southeast Asia, and I think I'll go to the Philippines and settle there. Wow. And then my mind's like, oh, this is totally weird and bizarre, right? Like, but yeah. sure, why not? Right. So when he said that. You know, we're gonna start a company and all that stuff. Like I, I just said, like you know, how how do you make sure that idea space gets involved in this? And he 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 actually really was also good, and he wanted to make sure that like you know we were involved in it. And obviously, like um, my friend Drawer, who runs Eric Schmidt's fund, was involved right. in it. And, and um, you know, Minette and Kickstart was also involved yeah, in it. Like yeah. he was very also um, you know courteous in making sure that. You know, he, he always remembered the people that was there in the beginning Absolutely. of his journey. And he invited us towards his journey. And we're just lucky that we were there. And, and even for me, like I was lucky that I was the, you know, the, the person that he met in the beginning. Yeah, look at him now, you know. Moved a little bit. And, 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 yeah, and I think his heart is in the right place. And I think that's the thing, right? Like, you know, you, the, 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 the best thing to do is to have a line both mission from a founder perspective and an investor mm-hmm. perspective, right? Like, I mean, obviously you can align the returns, but mm-hmm. that's easy. You want to align yourself on this other things too, right? And that's, that's I think, the X factor. You know? Okay. Now, uh, Earl, I, you know, we, we all know the, the runs, what are the wins, right? Now, it's how is it like for a VC where you know that probably 90% of people that would uh, talk yeah. to you is asking for money? How do you balance that out of not, being able to at least hear things out because especially you, you mentioned the numbers. There's hundreds and hundreds of people that are literally approaching you asking for the same thing. Give me money. Give me money. Right? <laughs> how, how do you weed that out? <laughs> and, and, you know, how do you... you know, the, make, uh, yeah. yeah, the funny thing actually, right, and obviously, you know, if you meet a real VC, like, you know, it's not, not my money. It's someone else's right, money, right? right? So right. you have to think about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but... But at least from that perspective, you know, to be honest with you, yeah, I mean, maybe you can't talk to everybody. Yep. But it's your obligation to at least hear people out, right? Mm. Um, and I know that's totally unscalable and people like, most of the people disagree with me, but I think mm. at least for me personally, like I want to hear people out and at least give them a little bit of the airtime to talk to me to yep. just, you know, at least I can give either feedback or reaction or something that will add value because you Again, you'll never know, right? Like, you know, some of these people you meet again for a split second right. might then be the people that will, you know, change the country at some point, right? Yep. Right. I mean, uh, you know, you're you're one of the examples, right? Like, you know, you were just like, you know, doing Night these things, dude. And then, you know, <laughs> nightlife, and like all these things, and then yeah. You know, you, you, you were just like talking to us and I was like, yeah, this guy's like really cool, man. And then, you know, I think I, I think that's the thing, right? Like, and you never know, right? Like, and now like we're, we're still talking even if, mm-hmm. you know, it's like a split second that maybe we met that first time. And yeah. I, I just like, 
I think that's the thing, right? Like, you know, the true belief, and maybe that's why, because I, you know, I, I, I came to the Philippines with a mission, right? It's like, yeah. how do I, how do I do this, and how to make sure, like, we build an economy based on oh. science technology, and if that's the case, then these technologies want to do it, then why not give the time, right? So I know it's not probably optimized, probably not even mm-hmm. the right thing. And obviously, like the the you know what we do at some point is like, yeah, I mean, I can't necessarily give you yes or no now, but what yeah. want to go through the process, and if the process says yes, then we can talk some more, right? So I think there's always an out that way, but I'm telling you, man, like it's 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 it's. The grind is is, yeah. is sometimes. I mean, obviously, sometimes it's like tiring, but yeah. it's also some of the most rewarding times probably in life, right? Just because you you get to hear different ideas from people, and you know how important their ideas are to themselves, right? So it's just I'm privileged to have that opportunity. True. Now, Earl, you said about the mission. Now, let's let's call a spade a spade. That mission. Is, is it the same because you had to leave idea space at one point and this is where I'm most curious because I knew the mission when I first knew you and then yeah I, I was like okay where is Earl going why is he leaving and that's yeah. where I kind of this the last time I saw you was that and now I'm completely in the dark why why go back and what was the mission like is it the same mission or is it just a detour attacking the same mission yeah so I mean um the North Star is always the same, right? Okay. Um, you know, talk to my wife, probably she, she probably heard like this North Star since the day that we got married yep. up to like anybody that probably knows me, right? And yep. I, I never deviate from that. Mm-hmm. So there was really this time where, you know, I mean, I was there for four years, I built Idea Space, mm-hmm. you know, by the time that I left again, I think it was really in a good spot. And then QBO was. was like running and, you know, we launched this thing in APEC with Slingshot and, yep. you know, all these things, right? Like, it just, I think it was in the right spot. And I remember there was one time I was giving a keynote and I don't know which keynote it was. And I just remember that, like, you know what? I'm I'm saying, like, a similar message. Um, I'm saying a similar tactics. And I'm also saying probably, you know, and I said, like, I think I've, I've, I've taught, but I haven't learned, mm-hmm. right? I, I, I need to learn some more. Um, mm-hmm. And then I realized very quickly um, that maybe there's a relearn cycle that needs to be done yeah. again for me. And I, that's why I talked to, I mean, I talk again to Envy, like, what should I do and all these things. And, you know, he, he and, and, you know, it's just lucky because when I started to, like, look around and tell people, like, you know, um, I got this amazing offer to work for a hedge fund in in in. in in, in the New York area wow. doing basically data and artificial intelligence mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I didn't know, to be honest I didn't know anything about data AI. Yeah. or AI at the time which now it's hot and sexy but at the time yeah. like it was just emerging and yeah. they've been nascent. doing this totally nascent like, yeah right and yeah. Um, I told you know MVP like what should I do and he's mm-hmm. like you know maybe you should learn maybe you should leave wow and I thought you know, funny, I was mentally prepared for him to be like, Earl, like, no, you're doing so well. Like, you should totally stay here and, like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, don't go back. But he, you know, I think he had the best intention. And he was like, I, you know, he said, like, what do you want to do? is like, I still want to go back to the Philippines someday. It's like, yeah, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be here. And wow, I, 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 that just kind of blew my mind, right? Because then it's it's like any founder, even you, Ron, right? Like, I mean, yeah. it's the same thing, right? Like, I mean, we, we go through this, like, like, cycles of just like grinding hustle like everyday stuff yeah. and then at some point you're like you know i gotta like pause just again lose and, like, control right wave? yeah yeah and what's the next wave right and i think i had to do this i mean it could have been like i could have started another fund or i could right. have started like to move to sing or whatever it could be any different things right but this was like my next wave right like how do i go back again to the u.s yeah. relearn new things be uncomfortable again right. and you know, I mean, uh, to be honest, like I, you know, being in in the Philippines and doing a lot of things for the startup ecosystem, to you know, working let's say in a hedge fund, reporting right. to people and stuff, like it was also hard for me, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, because right. I wasn't I wasn't running the thing, right? Like I mm. was part of the machine, uh, yeah. although you know I had responsibility that was kind of cool. But then it's still it's still not like your your own thing, right? But I knew there was a bigger mission and I had to learn these things and, you know, um, to put my ego in check and kind of make sure to do that, right? Absolutely. And, you know, there's, there's, I mean, 
was it difficult? So after like a year, year and a half, I, I left the hedge fund. I got burned out because I was working like 80 hour Ooh. days and weekends, right? I mean, wow. it's totally to, to, the 80 hour weeks, right? Like 80, 100 hour weeks, which is totally like crazy. But um, then I went back again to tech and then now, you know, and, and all these things, right? So, um, you know, I think it, it was it like smooth, you know, was it easy? Is it like pretty sure it's not? Yeah. It? No, right? But you know, the broader sense is the bigger question, right? Like, how do I prepare myself to be a better leader when 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 I come back to the Philippines at yeah. some point, a determined time? Absolutely. Right? Now, Earl, let's take a quick break. Let's talk about more on what you want to do next. And what's sure. you said, the same the same North Star you said, but now what we want to do next, and then what do you see are the opportunities that a lot of Filipinos are missing out? A lot of Filipino tech startup founders are missing out. More of that awesome. after the break. Thanks, Ron. Effective automation is the best way for businesses to stay competitive. And having a chatbot for your business lets you easily automate and optimize sales, marketing, and customer service in the digital age. Chatbot PH will build, train, maintain, and market your chatbot across all messaging platforms. Our team uses the latest AI technologies to enable you to better serve customers 24-7, 365. Set a meeting with us today. Message us now at m.me slash chatbotph. And we're back from the break. We're still with Earl Valencia, straight out of San Francisco at the moment. Yeah. Earl? Okay, so before the break, uh, you mentioned about you know adjustment from being at the hedge fund in New York, and now you're back in the Bay Area, right? That's I mean it, it's still within the U.S., but I'm pretty sure. And anytime you move, and every time you're in a different environment, especially when you came from Idea Space, when again you were the guy, you were calling the shots, and you know a lot of times when you you adjust, it's not just you know knowing where you are in the totem pole, right? Uh, it's also adjustment when your family has to be adjusting to. I'm pretty sure the kids came in with you as well and whatnot. How was that? I'm pretty sure there was a struggle. What was that process with you? And then how did you ad adapt to that life? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think in general, it's still kind of in transition, right? So my family is still in the New York area and I'm still here, okay. um, right, in San Francisco. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's actually multiple adjustments, right? So, I mean, obviously I know a little bit about technology and data and all these things, but then I'm in a financial services kind of world. And then obviously also reconnecting again with my network here in the Bay area. Right. So there's just a lot of multiple transitions and, you know, moving is always kind of hard, but at the same time, um, you have to know. So if, if you, if you go move or you make even a career move, right? Like, you have to ask the reason, like, why are you doing this? And not just because, like, it's either more money or, or anything else, right? So for me, it's, like, going back again to, like, the environment that I think I'm I'm thriving, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, I, I think even if I love New York as a city, um, I think it's just not a place for someone like me who is totally, like, wild entrepreneurial creative and a technology biased mm -hmm. person right mm -hmm. it's just not that environment and one thing that i learned very quickly in three years is that your environment matters Absolutely. and the people around you the people around you matter a lot for mm -hmm. your own success right and mm -hmm. i think that's just basically one of the things there correct now right? you said you mentioned about environment right now uh let's let's I, I want to pick your brains now. And over these years that you've been from the Philippines, you've been New, you've done New York, and now you're back in San Fo. What, what, sh what should fill in this in the realm of Philippine startups, right? Or people that that what is he? What are we missing out on? Because I'm pretty sure we we have the talent. We've had wins. There's more acquisitions happening now and whatnot. But for somehow, some reason, there's something amiss. And I, I, I can't point my finger on it. It can be a, 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 a mix of a lot of things. But in your perspective, from the outsider, from, from the point of where you are now, what's, what's missing and what should we do to improve our, our numbers the same way you did when you went to the state and had to give yourself a better chance? 
Yeah, so I mean, I think um, there's multiple things kind of in my mind, but I mean, actually, I'm also curious on your your own thoughts there, as okay. you you did the whole gamut, multiple startups uh, yep. up to an acquisition and all these things, right? Mm-hmm. So you also probably have a very good sure. kind of opinion on this, but at least for me, there's two two things I think that uh, we all need to make sure that we we kind of do. Like I think number one is um, the you know the strong bias really for um, for both global uh, global minded management mm-hmm. and global scalable technologists. Yeah. Right. And I'll tell you what it means. Right. One is about like if you have a startup founder or even like a business person. Right. Mm-hmm. Like. Um, you know, one thing that I appreciated kind of here is that, you know, again, remember that time that I mentioned where, um, you know, I, when I was in Boston, like, and yeah. I was like, all of a sudden I had to compete with like Chinese people, Indian people, yeah, yeah. like, you know, European people, all these things. Like, so it's just that like from a management perspective, from an ambition perspective, from a go-to-market perspective, how do you just set yourself up to compete at the global level yep. versus just like hiding and saying, you know, I'm going to be like number one in the Philippines, right? And yeah, yes. it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just, I think that's that's limiting, right? Um, Similar to and, how like a Filipino basketball player would go, was like, yeah, my dream is to be in the PBA. But, you know, we, we have your brother who's literally – leading the New York Knicks. It's like the Filipinos all want to be in the NBA. And by that time, a full-bred Filipino that gets to the NBA, I'm pretty sure the, 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 the country will go bonkers. So in that perspective, it should be looking from a global execution yeah, point of view. Yeah, totally, right? I mean, I mean, in the process, right? In the process of looking global, you'll default to become number one in the Philippines, right? As True. a stepping stone. Sure. So it's actually not even it's actually even the same, right? Like if you start, you know, if you start looking global, by default, you're probably also going to be number one in your home country just because you, you are there have locally, home court. right? You should right? have home court. For an advantage, yeah. so you're, yep. you're you have to do that. But then you're always looking out. So that's one thing that I think is 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 needed. Mm-hmm. And the other one is this global scalable technologist, right? So literally, mm-hmm. like. Can we design um, you know, technologies that can scale at a rapid pace? Can we make sure mm. that we're looking at like what are the large macro trends in technology in the world and apply them, mm. right, uh, to like problems that make sense? And then how do you also make sure that, you know, the product um, is you know the product that you build from let's say even a UX interface or like yeah. the user experience part. Um, and the potential scale part, like all of them have global standards when you build it, right? Absolutely. And, and we have a lot of talent. That's, yeah, that's the true, talent right? is here. The only the problem talent, is, the talent is there. we sell it all the time. We always think of like, ah, I'm going to sell my, my shit to, to X company so I can get benefits. We don't want to bet on ourselves. Like, you know what? I can build this shit and I can just need the right funding and support. We're always looking at, the, we're always into that racket mode, you know, like, ah, What's my neck racket? Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. right? And then I think as engineers, right, like just, uh, I think we have to develop, as, I mean, I'm, I'm an engineer too, right? Uh, you yeah. know, like that that whole notion of like, I'm building this thing that like millions of people will use someday. Yeah, yeah. Right? And even more so that like, you know, it's something that I, you know, I, I co-built with my own mind, mm-hmm. right? Because again, that racket mentality um, or, I mean, it's not a bad thing, right? The service yeah. mentality and stuff, sure. which is a lot of times like we're being fed by someone else's idea to execute. Correct. Correct. Right. But then, you know, this is the opportunity, right? Like building companies, building startups, building technologies. Like literally it's it's something that it could come directly from your mind and build it for yeah. other people to use, right? And right. that's, I think that's liberating. And I think that's why, let's say, engineers in in some parts of the world like here in san francisco right like that's the motivation right is to do the pride is to build global. things that are global yeah. products that people will use and that pride is so strong that motivates people that's why they're willing to eat pizza in the middle of the night right and build stuff just because they they can see that it's just this yeah. like you know they want to work on hard problems right that's like the right. even the attraction like in a place like facebook or whatever it's like how do you attract really good technology talent? It's mm. not like paying them more. It's like make them work on hard 
global scale problems. And Correct. I think that mentality needs to be kind of rubbed off. And again, we have the talent, we have the capability. I think it's all about just like making sure that we have these standards mm-hmm. um, always taken taking a check on, right? Yeah. Now, from my perspective, you said you wanted to ask the same question. I yeah, think- about you, man. I mean, you 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 built the company. You did the whole round trip. Now, I mean, yeah. you know, you probably have this whole perspective nailed. You know. Okay. Now, at, at least from my, I, I mean, I'm totally biased towards my own experience, but from a founder's perspective here, especially in the Philippines, I think a lot of the us who started in 2011, 2012. We were very naive. We were all greenhorns, you know. We didn't really know. <laughs> we have a lot of bravado, you know, all that stuff. Deals were coming, but not that big and whatnot. And a lot of us actually failed. If you look at the first waves of idea space of the Kickstarter, yeah, right now, yeah, 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 we've all failed. But one common denominator among also first movers here is that on our second try, we've had significant success whatever mm-hmm. it is that we've been doing. So a lot of it really just comes with the growing pains, you know. Oh, and yeah, sometimes, oh, totally. Uh, now, like, for example, I have, I've, I've been through the experience of closing a company that I worked on for eight years, let it, having to mm-hmm. let that go, how that felt. But without having to go through that, I wouldn't have sold a company that I just put up in 12 months and got acquired, right? Those things really helped me prepare for that. And, you know, now you're absolutely correct. It's, it's totally weird when we have all this talent, but we only do it from a Philippine setting. It's weird. I think it's experience, number one, and lack, lack of exposure. I, it's my first time to go to San Francisco last year. And most of the dudes there have a different vibe. They, you're, you're right. They're like, we're trying to create a global, they, they want to change the world, not just their own hometown. And by doing that, hey, even just the region, look, look at the grabs of the world, look at the go yeah, jets of yeah, the world. Yeah, exactly, totally. Just right. talk about Asia. Asia's big enough to just at least our oh, region, yeah. you know, to, to, to just transform. And more than that, we have the talent. I can literally name, handpick a couple of, I mean, a handful of guys right now who I can literally work with in that. It's just that we haven't had that epiphany yet to like, all right, let's go change the, the world. And that's why if you look at the Philippines here, our top apps are not made here, right? Except for, you know, a handful like the coins.ph, which is run hoses and whatnot. The grabs of the world, not a Philippine company and whatnot. We can do that as well, but we just have to have a bigger appetite for risk, I guess. Uh, mm-hmm. Because if we were able to prove it, I'm pretty sure the money's going to come to, to, to fund it. Yeah, I, 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 that's totally true, man. And I think that's something that I, you know, I mean, got inspired by, you know, someone like you and, and, and other people in their cohort, right? Like you just didn't give up and you grinded. And mm-hmm. I think it's just a matter of, you know, I think our next phase, uh, to be honest with you, uh, mm-hmm. is again, I think number one is that we all have to support each other, right? Like, yeah. I think that's the, that is the beauty, to be honest with you, of like our generation, yeah. our generation of like technology, startup, entrepreneurial people. Mm-hmm. Like, there is no incentive to do crab mentality. Yep, no. And that's the purpose right. of this, this podcast. Yeah, so that right. remove all the bullshit above the sugar yeah, coat totally. and let's get down and dirty and talk about how we're going to be able and to help mean, each other. Yeah, and to be honest, let's call people out, right? Like if, if you, you know, I think that's the good thing, right? Like, you know, if people are trying to like put people down, like just, you know, we yeah. don't have time for you, right? Put it in the butt. Because, yeah, exactly, right? I think that's the thing. I think we just have to like do that. And then number two, like, so we all have to support each other in this journey. And number two, mm. not support each other. Actually, there's going to be, like, I think the next big unicorn to come out of the Philippines is not going to be a, you know, like, uh, you know, I mean, obviously it's like, it's not going to be just like you, Ronster, like or me no, or like, no. or other people. It's all of us. There's probably a possibility that like couple of us together, yeah. With all our scars and learning, right. we'll then build the next unicorn. I am gonna, I'm gonna call this out right now on your podcast, man. Okay. I think if people are listening, listen well, right? Like I think let's learn from the lesson in the past five, six, seven years, maybe even ten years. And now, as you know, as as this generation now has grown up, like let's think of things that all together, like what are these big things we all want to attack? And like instead of building like different companies. And, Let's build one that will just stick and make sure it is done right, Absolutely. done right, and done the way we want. So that's something that I think. 
let's let's reflect if that's yeah. even the good strategy. And you're coming back, and you coming back will just open up a lot more doors. And you know, we, there's a, there's a lot of support. I mean, from Phil Dev, who's been there. Exactly right. Uh, exactly. We're just right. doing it in silos, majority of the time, in our own little way, right? Someone yeah. needs to unite these tribes, sort of like Wakanda, you know, <laughs> you know? and put, Holy, right? yeah, Avengers, right? right? Like, we're, yeah. we're we have to do an Avengers and like go go against like Thanos, Thanos, Thanos together, <laughs> right? Dude, True. that's the way, man. Like, I, I think that's the way, dude. And I think. Um, Dude, I'm telling you, this this is gonna be like the next wave is gonna be so amazing, right? Because yeah. it's 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 gonna be like all of us together, and we're not gonna leave people behind, you know. Now, last tip, Earl, before I let you go, um, sure. if you were talking to your younger self, what would the advice that you would be giving to to what 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 you you had to go through, or if someone wants to go in the same career path? That you did, I'm pretty sure it's not easy. <laughs> but let's just uh, hypothetically uh, go through that. What, what would be the advice that was, you'd give yourself? You know what? Like, you know, there's there, well, obviously there's one thing that I will won't change since I knew when I was young, and there's one thing that I would have changed, or if I realized oh. sooner, it would be better, right? Like, number one, that I I was lucky that in, when I was young, I always ask, why not? And why not try versus why do it, right? And for some of us, like we're just built maybe from our parents or something. Blind obedience. Like, yeah, like, oh, I, I can't do that. But then I, oh. I don't know why, but then I always like. My ask biggest why pet peeve, not. man. Yeah, like, yeah, for example, <laughs> like, I, I mean, even college, I told you, right? Like, I applied to like 10 schools. Why not? Like, I mean, if I don't get in, I don't get in. If yeah. I, you know, Every every big moment of my life, I just said like, why not? And it, it worked out in the end, just because you did something that like, it was impossible yesterday, it became possible today, yeah. right? And then the other one though, that I would tell my younger self is the art of letting go and mm. that there is a bigger plan. And I thought like, ah, you know what? That's all like, you're gonna control your destiny. But when I oh. look back in the past, you know, 30 plus years of my life. There's every, always curveballs. Yeah, all of these little things, right? Like going to the Philippines, even going to the U.S. for college, you know, or going to you. All these things is not in our control. Yep. Right. Um, so the only thing that you can do is to like, yeah, you know what? Like, you just have to maximize your opportunity, what's in front of you, and how do you just believe that like there is a, there is something bigger and that bigger and if someone's guiding you just like mm -hmm. say yeah maybe we should try it out right so yeah. um and maybe the last bonus part is that mm -hmm. environment matters and that's something mm -hmm. i just learned literally in the past one year yes. right like your the people around you the, the society around you the tribe yeah. like you got to make sure you're around your tribe yep. to succeed because yep. the world is already tough enough. What more if you're alone? What more if you're alone, man? Yep. That's crazy, dude. But then, I mean, I want to learn from you. Maybe before you close this segment, like, yep. what's your top one or two that you want to like tell the world and tell me of like what did you learn, man? For me, uh, number one from what I learned from Party File going through Chatbot is that you gotta be humble more than anything. And that, I know that's cliche, like okay, humility, whatever. But in a startup <laughs> world, from a founder's point of view, where you know there's ebbs and flows that you know, I was just talking about this in a, another episode with James Fernando um, of Shirtley. He said, "Yeah, I talked to him like, you know what? It's hard to be humble when you're winning. You know, we we need to be able to put your foot down and make sure that you know, hey, you know what? It's, it, things are going good now. But hey, guess what? Tomorrow you're gonna be walloped by a tsunami. Good luck. Yeah. So whatever yeah. those things, whether in defeat, you always have." do your best that that's what makes or breaks you right for me in my point of view when when party file closed down the biggest paradigm shift that happened for me was i wrote a blog uh oh yeah i saw that man yeah i wrote a blog because if i didn't do that i would probably be stuck in a rut till now i would have had a downward spiral and god knows what i'm going to be able to do to myself right but i had to write it down and you said the art of letting go right i had to do that and give myself a chance because you really just li really lose when you stop. Now, I'm not saying that you should bounce back right away, right? But be humble enough to admit 
that these are my mistakes. You come clean and you come clean and saying, at the end of the day, if you look it all up, it's my fault. Because yeah. that's the only t- time you're going to be able to move forward. And lastly, I, uh, more, more than anything, and you, I, I'll resonate what you said. It's surrounding yourself with the right people. Because if you're not surrounded with the right tribe, you will not flourish. No matter, you can't be Chuck Norris, I swear. Only Chuck, <laughs> Nor- <laughs> Only Chuck Norris wins against a thousand people, right? And it's not like that, you know? You, you need to be able to be surrounded with the right people who believe in you, put you in a position, or have a chance to win. Similar like, like LeBron James, right? I hate to say this, like, but you know, okay, He's in a good situation in Cleveland. He looked for a better opportunity. He wanted to go Hollywood. Now he's having a hard time because that's not his tribe. That's not his hometown, right? It's, it's a totally different dynamic. I'm not saying he's not going to think, but there's always an adjustment period. But if you're surrounded with people that believe you, doesn't have necessarily mean that they're going to sugarcoat you and babysit you, but put you in a position to win. And that's, what, yeah. that's, that's the most important thing. So for me, that came... With, with the support of the, the right partners, uh, who are the same co-founders that I have in Party File. So I was willing to take a risk. And then from that point on, all I, all I had back then, I didn't have money, I didn't have anything, but a ton of learnings that I know where the potholes were. I know who, what not to do and what to do. And I just came in with a cheat sheet of how to run a startup. you know. And then lo and behold, 12 months later, we got a card. Amen, brother. Amen. I think those are great lessons that like founders should uh, should have, right? Like I think it's just amazing, man. Like I'm, I'm really glad that you're talking now. I'm really glad that you invited me to the show just yeah, because like you're sure. one of these people that like you know you're 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 Mister Not Giving Up and making yep. sure that you just like grinding. And I I totally admire like what you did and you. all the success that you you've had so far is totally you know you deserve every bit of it. And so, kudos to you. All right, Earl. Before I let you go, what's your message to the Philippine startup ecosystem for everyone who's listening out there? Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing for every Filipino and Philippine founder is that. You know, it's our country, mm-hmm. right? It's we're we're the only ones that can. I mean, obviously, we can ask other people to help us, but I think it's our it's our responsibility, it's our imperative, and we're the ones that will change this country mm-hmm. in the next 50 years. Yep. Let's let's own that story. Let's make it a story we're all gonna be proud of, right? And let's not fuck um, this up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Like the, 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 the digital space, the internet, like. All the things that's happening levels the playing field for our country and yes. our generation to not be ashamed that we're from the Philippines anymore, yeah. right? Yep. And and it's our chance in the next 50 years. And I remember in one of my charts, you know, HSBC says that like we're ever yeah. going to be top 16 economy in the world. I, I remember that in one of my charts before I left. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's 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 up to us and our inspiration our generation our hustle mm-hmm. to make sure that that prediction becomes reality the your parents won't do that nope they're done they're done mm-hmm. it's up the to you now don't do that the government probably won't do that they'll support us mm-hmm. but it's up to us to make that reality it's you all right well thank you very much um it's been great. I'm I'm gonna see you this weekend, uh, this Friday, I think. Yeah, but, dude, I'll yeah. see you in Kubo, man. Yep. And uh, I, I'm, I, you know, I, you know, I definitely want to see everyone there. I, I'm really glad to be back in in a while. Um, I'm only there for a few days, but hey, oh, we'll man, make the most I, out of it. I'm so, ex- I'm so excited, my friend. All right, so. I'll see you on Friday. But again, that's that's it for now for the Hustle Share podcast. If you like this episode, please don't forget to subscribe to our uh, podcast in Spotify, iTunes, and in Google Podcast, and share this because this is a very rare episode. Again, thank you, Earl. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Peace. See you, my friend. Peace.